Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, today I'm here to talk about my dissertation, A Performance Guide to Wu Yiming's A Poem Carved in Stone. Sorry, I don't think my mic is fully taking my voice. So Wu Yiming and I met at um, Peabody, where we both were studying our masters back in 2012. Last year, Wu Yiming was planning to do a concert to promote Chinese living composers' um, music. And of course, the concert was canceled due to the COVID-19. As a result, he showed me his manuscript of a poem carved in stone, which was not completed yet by that time. There were only three pages. However, I was intrigued immediately by the combination of Chinese poetry and extended piano techniques. Wu Yiming decided to finish the piece and uh, dedicate it to me. While he was explaining some of those unconventional piano techniques, um, I noticed that it's almost impossible for other pianists to understand and play it without having practical instructions. Therefore, I decided to write this dissertation for pianists who would like to learn and perform it. A poem carved in stone is Wu Yiming's first substantial piano work. He began writing this piece in 2011 when he first arrived in the United States to study at Peabody with Michael Hirsch. Did he spend nine years on this work? Well, the answer is no and yes. He paused writing this work during his study at Peabody and then restarted it last year after he decided to finish it for me. He told me he couldn't find a pianist who would like to spend this much time learning the piece and then to perform it. So now he thinks it's time now. However, the work remained in his mind and it has ultimately become an accumulation of everything he has experienced in the past nine years. The piece is inspired by the poetry of Han Shan, a Chinese poet who lived during the Tang Dynasty. His poetry is in Buddhism tradition. Wu Yiming depicts the imagery and the philosophy in Han Shan's poetry through highly complex rhythms, extreme sound effects and pitch, tone clusters, and extended piano techniques. This dissertation will provide practical instructions for achieving these effects and executing the unconventional techniques found in this piece which include playing inside of the piano, various standing and seating positions, and a coordination and a balance. This study will briefly explore the historical and the cultural context of Han Shan's poetry and discuss how women's use of modern Western compositional devices reflects the Zen philosophy. An interview with the composer will be included along with an overview of both his compositions and those of composers who influenced him. Washington DC based Chinese composer Wu Yiming established, his, established himself as a promising young composer. His reminiscence of a dream for orchestra, the music um, you're listening to right now, was premiered by the Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra. While still only 27 years old, other works of his were premiered by those two other orchestras. A prize winner of many international competitions, Wu Yiming was the youngest recipient ever of the prestigious Toro Takamizu Award, um, Composition Award competition in 20 in 2007 in Japan.
Born in 1983 in Wuxi, China, similar to other young Chinese composers, Wu Yiming received solid early music trainings and was familiar with Western classical music, learning Western compositional techniques at a young age. Having grown up in the Jiangnan region of China, Wu is fluent in the Chinese folk music idiom and skilled at composing traditional Chinese instrumental music, which is called Mingyue in Chinese. This skill has inspired his approach in his later compositions where he used Western instruments to imitate the timbre of Chinese traditional instruments, which can be found in a poem carved in stone as well. What you're looking at now is a watercolor painting of a typical looking of a water town in Jiangnan region of China. This painting is by a famous Chinese painter, Wu Guanzhong. His work for Chinese chamber orchestra, the December Concert of Swan, composed in his junior year at the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing, impressed his professors and composers, including famous composer Chen Yi, who spoke highly of his work. One of the composers who has had a major influence on Wu Yiming's work is Toro Takamitsu. In addition to the prize of the Toro Takamitsu Composition Award competition, Wu Yiming admits that Takamitsu's approach to time and space have inspired him a lot. In this slide, you can see two excerpts. Uh, the top one is from Takamitsu's quotation of a dream, and the bottom one is from Wu Yiming's a poem carved in stone. We can see this influence clearly here, including frequently changed, changing time signature, extremely slow tempo, irregular rhythmic divisions. We we'll say that when it comes to reproducing the flowing quality and space of Chinese poetry in his music, the Western traditional metric organization seems odd to him. Takamizu influenced him the way to construct metrical organization and rhythms in his work. Chinese poetry has always inspired Wu Yiming's compositions. In addition to a poem carved in stone, Reminiscence of a Dream for Orchestra was inspired by um, Tang Ying, a poet lived during the Ming Dynasty. His poem, Tao Hua An, uh, which you can see on the left of the slide, and this is the original text in Chinese. Another work on the Gate Tower at Yozhou for tenor and piano was inspired by Chen Ziang, a poem lived during the Tang Dynasty. His poem, Deng Yozhou Tai Ge. In a second, you will hear the tenor singing the text in Chinese. <laughs> And the tenor, he is American, but I think his pronunciation of Chinese is really fantastic. Now I'm going to talk about Han Shan, whose poetry inspired Wu Yiming's a poem carved in stone. According to scholars, Han Shan's real name is unknown. This mysterious monk named himself Han Shan, which means cold mountain in Chinese. Han Shan is also the name of the place where he lived for 70 years in the Tiantai Mountain in Zhejiang Province. Han Shan's historical and cultural prominence can be found in both Asia and Western cultures. Han Shan appears in the sources of Taoist and Buddhist scripture dating back as far as the 9th century, and his poems have been well accepted since they first appeared 
in Japan in the 16th century. Due to the worldwide distribution of his poetry, Han Shan has had a profound impact on literature, media, art, and music. Since Gary Snyder's English translation of Han Shan's poetry came out in 1958, Snyder's Cold Mountain Poems, the one you're seeing on the slide right now, has been widely read by American college students and poetry lovers for more than half a century. Han Shan became a timely icon and influenced the Beat generation. Later in the 90s, American novelist Charles Fraser quotes the first two lines of Han Shan's poem in his novel, uh, which is showing on the left side of the slide. This book, Cold Mountain, won the US National Book Award. Its film adaptation received seven nominations at the Academy Award in 2003. Han Shan has been featured in paintings and prints by Bryce Marden. These paintings and prints can be seen at the Tate in London, UK, the Metropolitan Museum, and the Museum of the Modern Art. Finally, Han Shan's poetry has been an inspiration in music. In addition to Wu Yiming, Jonathan Harvey, a distinguished British composer of international importance, uses Han Shan's poem in his work, One Evening. Harvey argues that what we love in music is what we call emptiness, and we can often find emptiness in good music. Harvey believes that the emptiness he looks for is hidden in Han Shan's poem. Harvey and Wu both are inspired by Han Shan's poetry and philosophy as they depict the true mind through their music. The connection between Han Shan's poetry and Wu Yiming's music can be seen in the title of a poem carved in stone. A poem in the title refers to Han Shan's poem number 200. On the left side is the original text in Chinese. On the right side is uh, the English translation of the poem by Robert Henriks. Terms such as way, cliff, moon in this poem contain symbolic meanings which imply the spiritual search and realization of enlightenment in Buddhism philosophy. A poem carved in stone is an embodiment in words of Wu Yiming's musical approach to Zen philosophy and enlightenment. It is a musical turnout on his way to the nature of the true mind. Next, I will give practical instructions to this piece. Before pianists start learning the extended piano techniques in this piece, they should familiarize themselves with the component parts of the piano. It is important to know how the iron bars divide strings into sections. With different brands and the models, the division of strings is slightly different. I was practicing on a Steinway M while learning this piece. So this picture shows uh, inside of the piano, uh, focusing on the string section and M bars of the Steinway M. As you can see, the bass bar is between the B flat and the B natural. But on the Steinway D, which is the piano I'm going to perform the piece tonight, the bass bar is between E and F, which is an augmented fourth down uh, from where the bass bar locates in Steinway M. This differentiation uh, causes a few problems, especially when you practice on the Steinway M but perform on the Steinway D, because um, string techniques in this piece are executed around the bass bar, especially with the harmonics. The location of partial harmonics nodes 
which means certain spots where you press on the strings, will be relocated. I will give more details about this when showing how to produce harmonics on the piano string in a second. The usage of pedals plays an important role in this piece. Although there is no pedal marking on the score, pianists should use pedals to assist executing extended techniques and to achieve the desired sound effects. Both damper pedal and sustenuto pedal, uh, which is the middle pedal, will be used in this piece. The damper pedal should always be depressed before the execution of extended techniques on strings to create more resonance. Now let's look at cases where the sustenuto pedal will be used. So the first two clusters, as you see in this piece, will need the sustenuto pedal and then immediately you will need to play the top line with your mallet. And we need a sustenuto pedal again for this line, but I'm still using the sustenuto pedal to hold the two clusters. So here we'll need to use the finger sustenuto pedal. So you will need to use your finger to press the key silently, raise the damper, and then play. As you can hear, so there is a resonance because I'm holding the key down. And the reason why I need a sustained noodle pedal instead of damper pedal for um, this mallet line, because what you see encircled in orange, that short notes, the quintuplet um, in the bottom line need to be very short and articulated. So the purple SP means sustained noodle uh, is used again in major three. I don't know if you can see on the slide, but uh, here on the right side, that's another example of major nighting where you will need sustenuto pedal again for this big, big clusters uh, in order to facilitate a clear entrance for the bottom, for the um, top line of the mallet. Positions um, at the piano vary greatly in this piece. Usually pianists remain in a standing position while implementing techniques inside the piano. However, in this piece, it is impractical to play some highly demanding conventional passages on the keyboard from a standing position. More importantly, you will not be able to use both the system noodle pedal and damper pedal while remaining in a standing position. Therefore, the pianist should sit much higher than usual and stay close to the piano in order to better see and reach the strings. Occasionally, the pianist may need to stand up when the partial harmonic notes are too far to reach, which usually happens when there is no need for the system noodle pedal. The mu music stands needs to be removed because you want to access the full string section. It's highly recommended to memorize the piece. For security, the pianist can have the score on the music stand placed far at the back, as you can see in the picture. To execute the extended piano techniques in the piece, Pianists will need these tools listed um, in the slide. So percussion mallets, um, the head of them are made of different materials. Um, and they, as you can see, they come in different sizes. So you will um, need to try them in different materials and in different sizes in order to pick the proper ones to make the best sound 
uh, while playing them on strings. Um, here, triangle beater. So the one I'm using is a medium size, which give me enough give, gives enough vibration on the vibrating strings. And where um, the placement of mallets and the triangle beaters, um, I put the triangle beater here in this triangle area, or you can see uh, in the picture because it's close to where it's going for the C-sharp string set. Uh, for mallet, I put them here between the bass bar and the treble bar one, because that's enough space, and uh, it's easy to access. As you can see, I wrapped the stick with um, sewing threads, because they couldn't make a lot of noises. So no tags, um, I already marked them on dampers, that helps you to locate uh, what you are going to do with iron bars or string. And uh, chalk, so, sewing threads, that's for strings only. Uh, especially with all the harmonics, you will need to mark the specific point of the string with either chalk or sewing threads. In the picture, um, that's, that was done when I was practicing the piece. I noticed that with chalk, it doesn't stay very well because when the string starts vibrating, the marking of by, done by chalk um, disappears during, during you, you're playing and the string vibrating. Also, I will need to touch those spots more than one time in this piece, so they will go away, and that would create a, a huge panic uh, while performing it. So that's why I would really recommend to use sewing threads and you can see I knot them on strings. They stay very well. It's safer than using chalk. Tonight, I, I only marked it with chalk, and I'll, later I will uh, perform it without the sewing threads because I know most of the spots very, very well. Also, I didn't have enough time to, to tie them. That takes about 30 minutes to tie six string sets, as you can see in the picture. So uh, techniques with forming objects. Let's start with mallet. Uh, as you can see, this um, technique is to imitate the timber of wu yu, which is a wooden percussion instrument. And that's usually you, what you hear in Buddhist music. So um, there are two types of strike uh, using mallet. The first one is to strike strings. And the notation, as you can see, is in the top line. So the A flat note, you will need to use a mallet to strike upon strings. Here, I have two different mallets, as you can see. So the green one has a smaller head. I use this when only one note is indicated, which means there would be only one string set I need to strike. But later, you will see there, um, there would be more than one string set you will need to strike. So I use this bigger one, which gives a fuller coverage and uh, um, make a clarity of the resulting sound. So while um, executing this technique, I noticed it's very easy to hit the round strings because of the natural bouncing of the mallet. Um, so there is a, an alternation, which you can see um, on the right side. You can also strike the segment between the iron frame and the agraphy. So this section, while you're striking the string here, you will feel uh, much easier, and this is more in control because you're closer to the object. Um, both mallets, they are very hard, so that could make a damage to the string. And anything we use here in of Piano can make a damage to string, so we should always be very careful. Uh, in order to protect the, the instrument during the practice, instead of striking the strings, you can also use your mallet to strike the iron bar, the frame, to practice the striking motion and the rhythm and the coordination. 
until you are ready to actually play them on strings. So next one is um, strike the iron bar. This one is very straightforward. The notation, as you can see, is the, on the, on the, in the top line, the black note. So you will need to always depress the damper pedal before you do anything inside of the piano to create enough resonance. So you will hit the iron bar. And probably you cannot hear that through internet or sitting far away. Um, and then you will move there to strike the strings. Triangle beater, so uh, the notation as you can see is in the bottom of the music. So here you will need to depress the damper pedal. And I already marked the C sharp string set here. So I will need to play the key and almost at the same time putting the triangle beater on the vibrating, vibrating string set. So you can see it, it keeps vibrating, so you have to be careful when removing this away from the string set. You don't want to make extra buzz or stop the vib vibrating. String techniques. The composer states that the string techniques in this piece are greatly inspired by the Chinese instrument Gu Qing, whose sounds are produced by plucking open strings, stopped strings, and harmonics. It's recommended to listen to some Gu Qing music in order to imitate the timbre while executing the string techniques. And that's a picture of Gu Qing. Uh, there, are seven, there are seven strings. Harmonic is the most difficult string techniques in this piece because the finger must be placed exactly on a sp um, specific point of the string. Firstly, pianists need to know the definition and the relationship between fundamental harmonic node and partial. The fundamental is the actual pitch heard while playing a note on the keyboard. When the note is played, the string vibrating in halves, third, quarters, and so on, each creating a different harmonics. In order to hear the harmonic note instead of the actual pitch, so if I'm playing this D note right now, the pitch you're, you're hearing is the fundamental and it's vibrating in half, third, and quarters. But if I want to hear the specific harmonic note, let's see, I want to hear this note. And according to the chart, that's the second partial, so I would press my finger on this very specific point of string. So this is going to be a little bit far because it's halfway of the string. playing this, but it, what you just heard is the pitch of this D. So that very specific oops, sorry, spot that uh, I just pressed is called a node. And uh, um, the different harmonics that can be produced on the string are identified with term partial. So on the left side, you can see um, those are two side view of string starting from uh, from left to the right you see tuning pin agraphy so it's following the same order as what you see here in the piano tuning pin agraphy damper and that's where you can reach so third partial is uh, fairly close and the midpoint is far is much further and there is also you can do fourth partial the chart is very, very helpful when you need to find the harmonic notes. So what I just did is a second, um, as you can see, so that's an octave, and sounds like an octave of the fundamental note. If I want to do the third partial, let's say, and you can see interval, that's a 12th, uh, which means an octave plus 
perfect fifth. So if I'm pressing the third partial of the string set of this D, so what you just heard is is this note, right? And A, so that's twelfth interval from this D. So that's how you do the harmonics. And the finding harmonics on the strings, um, usually you need to take a little bit of time to look for the clear and the full sound. I just marked it, so I could just go straight and produce the harmonic. But if I didn't mark anything there, then I will search for it. So. So what I'm doing now is to find the fourth partial on the same string set. As you can see, while moving up a little bit, the sound is disappearing. But if I move down, and you can tell the difference, because they can be clear or disappearing, or not very clear. This is almost like tuning instrument for other instrumentalists. So yeah, we pianists have to deal with in tune in this piece. Uh, this is, if you're curious, this is how it looks like when you're doing the harmonic. Uh, you can use other fingers as well, the fingertip, to press the specific point of a string. There are problems in this piece uh, because the composer indicated third partial harmonic. So in the score, it says third, par third partial harmonic of G. But here on this piano, I'm not able to reach the point of third partial because how the bass string constructing this piano, uh, the, that spot is completely blocked by bass string as you can see in that picture on the right side. Um, so what I, uh, what I have to do is to find an alternation, a substitution of the third partial. I do want the same harmonic note, which is D, that's um, the, the note D in, in white. Um, so instead, I'm playing second partial of this D, which comes out with the same harmonic note. And uh, when you're looking for that, you need the help of this chart. It indicates where you can find all the substitution using other partials instead of the third partial. So here the red notes indicates what I'm actually playing um, on the Steinway M and the Steinway D while the st certain spot of the third partial is not reachable because of the way how piano string constructs. And you can also see this actually um, on the keyboard where I'm pressing the actual key forms a second or an octave, which saves me a lot of time while producing harmonics. Because I want to focus on strings pressing the certain spot. I don't want to do both. I don't want to look at the keys while doing the harmonic. So here with this position, it's very safe to and easy to produce harmonics. Once you find all the spots that you need to press on strings, you want to mark them with, um, in this picture, sewing threads. As you can see, I marked um, six spots with three different colors. So I put them in three pairs because every time they appear in the piece, they always is two harmonic notes in one bar. So there are six in three different measures. In this way, that also helps me to locate them visually. Pizzicato is very straightforward in this piece. You do not need any um, extra tool to execute this technique. Just use the finger T. As you can see, so the, the little black triangle, that means where you do the pizzicato. Um, they're great, they're um, great distance to each other. The iron bar helps you to locate it. For example, in, um, on this piano, Steinway D, the low E is right next to the bass bar. So you don't even need to mark the damper and you just go next to the iron bar to plug the string. 
because it doesn't give you a lot of time to look for them. Mute effect, this is my favorite string techniques. Um, I found the sound is fascinating while doing this. I don't know why, but I really like the sound. It's very easy. You put, as you can see in the picture, fingertip, but close to the agrophy because you want a long lasting mute effect. The last string techniques, glissando. Also very straightforward. So in those three measures, uh, the first part where you see the blue arrow that's down on strings. And you need to go back and forth rapidly. Then with the orange arrow that's on keys going to the last note, and then again back to strings. They're here to imitate the wind and the evil spirits. Special keyboard techniques. First one, clusters. Um, here, inspired by his composition professor at Peabody, Michael Hirsch, Weiming makes liberal use of tone clusters, which can be heard frequently in Hirsch's piano works, such as Vanishing Pavilion. In this piece, clusters can be divided into two groups, semitone clusters and pentatonic clusters. The semitone cluster appears in two ways in this piece. So the first one you see right now is with every note written out clearly. It is helpful to mark the contour of each cluster as you see in blue letters. That's the, the top and the bottom note of each cluster. The increase of beam here look like a crescendo mark uh, means echelando. So how can we work on this clusters and make an effective echelando? There are three steps. So first, you want to find the top note of each cluster. So that's actually a chromatical scale, ascending scale, but in great distance and going downwards. And then you play the contour of each uh, cluster, which happens to be a major third. After that, you fill in with all the notes in between. And then you do the echelando. I guess this is too effective, this one. Um, so the right side, that, that cluster is also a semitone cluster, and uh, this is indicated in this uh, unconventional symbol. You will use your palm to play all the notes below this F. Uh, sorry, I caught the bass clap out, but it's here. So uh, the notes you play that varies uh, since each performers have different size of palm. Uh, the second one, pentatonic clusters, very similar to the one we just saw, but you play only the black notes. I personally prefer using fingers instead of my palm while playing them because that, um, that helps me to shape the clusters in each bar. Other than using palm, also it's hard to play them all together. Um, so this piece, a poem carved in stone, is a demanding piano piece with, which requires pianists to multitask. It's funny, I often read that um, women are great at multitasking. So I don't, I don't know if that's one of the advantages of being 
female pianist to play this piece. Uh, combined techniques can be found in many places in this piece. So what you are seeing right now in the picture, that's the very beginning of the piece. Um, I want you to hold the mallet while playing the first two clusters because immediately I want you to go here to strike the string. There's no time for me after playing this and then go to grab and then whether also I will do a lot of things here and also with the pedal. So it's better to hold it while playing. And then do this. So that saves a lot of time and uh, make the transition from the keyboard to the string much smoother. Another example is uh, a passage a passage between major 10 and uh, 15. I don't know if you can see, but I, uh, I marked almost all of them with a purple number and the letters. RH means right hand, LH means left hand. So the, this music is written, most of them are written with five step. Uh, it's very overwhelming when you're first time looking at it. So here on the top, that's played by right hand. Um, and then immediately left hand goes to pluck the string pizzicato. I should probably move my mic here. And then, um, so the one in blue circle, that's where you grab your triangle beater, put it here. And then right hand goes to pluck the string, immediately using mallet to hit. The orange arrow means where you put the mallet back. And then blue air, arrow, um, that's where you grab the triangle beater and put it back left hand. So I, I didn't explain, I just did it, but you can see there are a lot of movements just with those four motions. And then right hand goes there while left hand is playing on the keyboard. So what you just heard is one of the examples where you need to multitask, and I was doing kind of out of tempo. Um, that's why it is a very demanding piece with uh, conventional techniques and extended techniques often occur simultaneously. Um, let's see, so in addition to understanding Han Shan's poetry and uh, mastering the extended techniques, it is important to know the composer's thought about interpreting his piece. This is one of the luxuries of working with a living composer. To help performers to interpret this piece, Wei Ming provides a program note, which was in his mind while composing a, po a poem carved in stone. It was written in Chinese originally when he sent me, uh, thanks my dear friend, Dr. Shi Yao Wang, made this amazing um, translation. So at the end of the program note, you see in which Han Shan's poem is carved, and then that's the num uh, Han Shan's poem number 200 that we saw earlier. So this also tells why this piece is titled as a poem carved in stone. It's from this story. So this the story presents performers with a vivid image along with special sound effects. In order to convey this imagery to the audience, the performer needs to understand Wei Ming's use of tempo, time signature, and rhythm in this piece. For instance, when 
imitating the timber of Gu Qing. Um, rather than counting strictly, the performer should feel the pulse and allow the sound to simply resonate in space. So circle in pink and blue, that's this, this is harmonic and pizzicato. They both are here to imitate the timbre of Guqin. So um, on the other hand, the performer should also make use of the relatively stable rhythm, uh, which is the highlighted ones um, on the score, to maintain the inner pulse and the directive phrase. So this is the same passage I just showed you for the multitasking. Um, I know it looks overwhelming, but you should not be afraid when you first learning this piece. As you can see, the, sometimes you have bass clef on top and a treble clef in the bottom. We're so used to traditional writing where you always see bass clef is in the bottom. But here's, I would recommend to you always find the lowest spot and the highest spot um, in the piece or in that certain passage. And then make your body and hands very um, comfortable with this space and positions. And then practice what in between this space. So here, um, the bass figure, they're the most stable uh, figures in this passage, as you can see, and also the mute effect here, because they are on the beat, so that also gives you a pause. That's something you could count on while practicing it. The score is full of dynamics detail, dynamic details as you see in this first seven bars, which should be performed as written. The dynamic change and the intensity of irregular rhythms express a wide range of emotional states. In the contrast with the metal line, what do you see below those full, uh, were full of the dynamic details indicates the, the evil spirits. So the monk is trying to dis dispel the devil by tapping Mu Yu. Conclusion, a poem carved in stone composed of many interesting elements including Asian Chinese poetry, Zen and extended piano techniques. Through learning a poem carved in stone, the author which means me, was able to discover a rich palette of tones and the timbre that are not often heard in traditional classical works. However, the ability to realize tone and timbre and bring them out comes from years of study and playing the traditional classical music. It is unfortunate that while we demand the newest and the latest in so many aspects of our lives, most performers are and audience still prefer music composed 200 years ago um, to music composed in our time. This study aims to encourage pianists to learn and perform more music written by living composers. I hope that this performance guide, in addition to offering instructions for playing this piece, can draw people's attention to music from living composers, can raise their curiosity in, about new works with new techniques, and can enjoy the process of learning and recreating these works. Now I'm going to perform this piece.